so, say it. Let me uh, <clears throat> introduce this problem. It is a problem of time optimal control problem, <clears throat> which means the objective function <clears throat> is just this, maximize zero to t integral minus one dt, which is basically saying minimize. This says maximize minus t, which means minimize t. <clears throat> so that's the objective function, right? <clears throat> the problem is goes like this. So let's assume <clears throat> this is a train track. Okay? And this is at zero is the station. Okay. A train could be, this is a negative coordinate, this is a positive coordinate, so this is a positive direction, this is a negative direction. <clears throat> a train can be anywhere here, so that is the location of the train, and it can have any velocity. So for example, if the train is here, and it is moving in this direction, then its velocity is given by this point here. So that is the location of the train on the graph, but that location means the train is here and moving with that velocity in that direction. That's why. Why is the velocity? X is the position. Positive velocity, negative velocity, left coordinate, right coordinate. So if the train is here, it means the train is here and is moving in that direction. <clears throat> that point means train is here and moving in this direction. Okay. So I should start with any point in this diagram. <clears throat> so that point tells me the train is here and its speed is given by that vertical coordinate. So it's moving in that direction at that speed. So if it's moving in that direction, I want to accelerate or decelerate that train so that it stops here. What do you mean by stopping here? Stopping here means not here, because that means the train is at the, at the station, but it's still moving. I want the train to be here and its velocity to be zero. So my aim is, the terminal condition of this problem is x zero is zero and y zero is zero. So that remember there are two state variables here now, x and y, and I want both of those variables to be zero at the end, at capital T. So, <clears throat> That's the objective function, and that's the terminal condition. X t is zero, y t is zero. It's a fixed endpoint problem. That require that the time is a decision variable. This is simple, but that's okay. Uh, our our problem allows f to be minus one, capital F to be minus one, objective function. So we have a regular problem, <clears throat> and we have a fixed endpoint problem. And the the train can Maximum velocity of the train. No, that's the velo that's not a velocity. That's acceleration. So we're going to get to that later. So that's so far what we got. So what what do we have? We have a train that is moving at a certain speed at a given point point in on the track, and our job is to apply force. Force means either accelerate. That means that means you know put the pedal down or brake, which means apply the brake. Either way, there's a force. One is called deceleration, one is called acceleration. So we can accelerate if it's too slow here, and once you get here, you might have to accelerate it. If it is too fast, you might have to decelerate it to get here. So applying force means 
changing the speed of the train. We cannot change the speed of the train without accelerating or decelerating because the force, according to physics, is mass times the acceleration. So we apply the force. If there's a mass, which you're going to assume to be one, so the force gives you one times acceleration. In the book, we have m, and then we set m equal to one, m being the mass of the train. But force then basically is acceleration, x double dot. Okay, so that's what we are trying to get, <clears throat> and that's our control. Our control is to apply force in one direction or the other direction, and get the train to come to stop here. So, the analogy of the moon would be our location is on Earth somewhere with a zero velocity. We want to accelerate it, go into the space, and eventually the moon is here. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's it's not a one-dimensional trick. It's a it's a it's a it's a three-dimensional trick trick trick. So uh, the position of the train is x y z. That is a location in in a three-dimensional space. X y z are the three points, and x dot y dot z dot are the three acceleration in three different directions. That's all you need. That's a six equations. So if you know X, Y, Z, so if you look at the moon problem, moon problem, <clears throat> we'll have X, Y, Z and X dot, Y dot, Z dot. And then <clears throat> it will have the location of the location of the moon will be x, y, z equal to 0, 0, 0, whatever 0, not 0, 0. x, t will be the x coordinate of the, the, the point on the moon. y, t is the y coordinate of the point on the moon, and z, the z coordinate of the point on the moon. And that is the point you want to reach. And the beginning is the point on Earth, and that's what's given to you. The six coordinates are given to you, 0. You can call it the origin if you want. <clears throat> and then you call whatever the the, the <clears throat> And our job <clears throat> is to accelerate and decelerate each point in space so that it comes to rest at on the moon. In this case, the train. So far, so good. So <clears throat> initial condition is x0 and x dot 0. That's the velocity. OK. And Initial velocity is y0. So as you can see in our example here, y0, x0 are the velocity. So the initial velocity is y0. This is given to us. But <clears throat> we apply a force, which is x double dot. Remember, force is mass times acceleration. Mass is 1, so force is exactly equal to x double dot. 2 times derivative of x, which is called the acceleration. 1 time derivative is velocity. Two times the derivative is acceleration. So we apply the u. That's our force. That's our control, and that gives you this acceleration. <clears throat> so you you break this down into two. You call this to be y dot because acceleration is the velocity. Well, first derivative of the velocity. So that's y dot equal to u. And x dot is the velocity. So that's y. <clears throat> so this equation can be rewritten as two equations. <clears throat> Only thing given to us are the x0 and y0, which is the position and the velocity. We are not given x double dot 0, because x double dot 0 is the control. What acceleration we apply at the initial condition is our, our decision. <clears throat> and u <clears throat> is given as minus 1 plus 1. But remember, in 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 the space program, you will have three of these. X double dot, Y double dot, Z double dot, which means acceleration in X direction, Y direction, Z direction. And so the, the, it's, it's a complicated 
you you know the diagram you, you you learn the diagram in a physics where you have a velocity in this direction velocity in this direction and you take a parallelogram and you find out which way that stuff is going so that's a two dimensional you do the same thing in three dimensions okay <clears throat> so we have a control problem defined this is our control problem this, by the way, is a special case of a control problem in chapter two, even chapter one, where we had x as a vector. When x is a vector, this is x1, this is x2. But I rather not have too many subscripts, so I put x and y. <clears throat> Any question this far? Because then we're going to start solving this problem. Not from my end, Professor. Yes, question. No, I'm saying not from my end, Professor. I'm okay, good. anyone, anyone? Okay, if you're silent, then there's no question. Or you're going home. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> did you, okay, tell me anybody who has, who has not read the chapter before coming here. I hope all of you read before you come to the class, because that is, really the most important part you can do. Uh, that's the only way you 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 can learn in this fast pace. Because then you learn <clears throat> as a PhD student, you kind of read papers and if you don't understand, you discuss. So what you discuss is what you don't understand. Hamiltonian, so there, there's a straightforward straightforward thing we should apply. Hamiltonian is minus one coming from here. Lambda one times y, which is which is lambda one times x dot, which is y, and a lambda two dot y dot, which is u. So we have two lambda one. I should have put lambda in, but the mu u, mu is get used for other things. That's why I don't want to put. So I, I have a I have a subscript. Otherwise, I would have to say phi and psi or something like that. Okay. So lambda one y lambda two times u. Lambda one lambda two satisfy. It's a fixed end on problem. So lambda one is a constant to be determined and lambda two is a constant to be determined. Lambda two dot is minus lambda one. Lambda two t is beta two. And remember, all of this that I'm doing is <clears throat> we're taking the derivative of this Hamiltonian to get this minus, minus delta h minus delta y gives you lambda one, gives you lam minus lambda one. So we're taking the derivative, we get this. Since I just tell you this, I'm not telling you, and sometimes the Hamiltonian is in the previous page, then you have to go to the previous page. But if you read the book before you came here, then you will understand this, and I don't have to go through finding the Hamiltonian, take the derivative and come here, right? Because that is a standard part that you should know already. But if you don't do that, then you don't understand where that is coming on easily, and it will it will it will suffer your further understanding. So it's a fixed on point problem. So we have two variables, lambda one, lambda two, to be determined. We can easily solve this equation. So this is our solution. Lambda one t is a constant because this is zero. So lambda one is going to be beta one all the way through, and lambda two will be this one. And given the Hamiltonian is only lambda two is the only control, so your lambda two is this. So this comes here. This is our switching function, and our control is bang bang. Okay. And we can apply one more condition, which is Hamiltonian condition for time optimal control. So transfer salary condition 3.15, which is the condition on Hamiltonian with S sub T. You can then apply that condition. You see what I mean now? I'm if I for me to tell you this one, I have to go to 3.15, take all those derivatives and give you that. Okay. So and there you need yt, so yt equal to zero in this case. S is zero, so S sub t is zero. This is the condition S 
h plus s sub t at t equal to t star should be equal to zero. That is 3.15. When h is lambda 2, t star u star t minus 1, and s t is minus 1. So you get this equal to zero. And that is your condition for optimal T star. And given that condition, since we don't know beta, we know the following. We know U star T has to be either plus one or minus one. So if lambda two T star is beta two, uh, <clears throat> equal to minus one and u star t equal to minus one is one way to do that. And lambda two star beta two is plus one and u star plus one is another way to satisfy that equation. Any question here? Okay, so now the next part is how to use all of these conditions to find a solution. And this is somewhat tricky in this problem. If you if you if you are if you are there, you don't know where to go. And so I'm going to switch to the figure first because this problem has been solved by many people before. <clears throat> And if I continue through this, uh, it is better for us to go to the figure first and then come back to this place. Because there are a lot of formulas involved here. So let's go to the figure first. Well, let me let me go one more thing here so that we 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 can we can so we have two cases two cases are in this table one case is u star minus one another case is u star plus one this is the, the this is the terminal condition but what we can do is we can see that um Since switching function is a linear function of the time remaining, because this is the time remaining, it can change sign at most once. And therefore we have two cases. One is minus one in this interval. This is, I am at any t now. Okay. So any t to t star, there is any point tau in between. You start out can be minus one between this interval, or it can be plus one in this interval. This is towards the end. I start from t to some t star. If I do this, because it's going to switch only once, so some place is going to switch. I am trying to tell you what happens after we switch. Okay, because if you're going to switch somewhere, either you don't switch at all in which case you are, you are going to be here or here. And if you switch, then you're going to be here towards the end. And the end is you start tau minus one. And if you switch and the end is plus one, you're going to be here. So we are looking at, remember, we already know what, is, this is now dynamic programming going backward. We already know where we are at T star. Whatever T star is, we will find that later. But we're trying to say that we are there at T star and we are arriving there with this control or this control. Suppose we arrive with this control. We arrive with this control, we can solve the problem in this interval. To solve the problem this interval, we get yt is T minus, 
because y dot is u, u is minus 1, so y t is t star minus t. And then once you have a y, we integrate x dot is y, so we integrate that, so this would be a quadratic of that, so it's minus, minus that divided by 2, minus square of that divided by 2. So these are basically two simple differential equations. We solve that. And when you solve that, I can eliminate t star minus t. If I eliminate time, then I get this equation. This equation is a parabola for y bigger than 0. If I'm here, I get these two trajectories for x, t, y, t. And gamma plus is a parabola for y less than zero, means negative velocities. OK? And in this table, we have plotted gamma minus and gamma plus. And these are the switching curve because switching is taking place at t. Small t. So let's now look at the picture. That's gamma minus and that's gamma plus. This is y less than zero. If you look at it, gamma plus is, is y less than zero. You see this is y less than zero because t minus t star, t star is bigger than t, so this is less than zero, and this is bigger than zero. So you can see gamma plus and gamma minus. And it is a parabola, it goes like this. Parabola goes like this. This is another parabola, it goes like this. But of that parabola, we are only interested in one part of the parabola, which is the upper part on this gamma minus, and on the other one, we are interested in this lower part. What are we trying to say here? We are now trying to say, is that if the train is here, which means the train is in a negative direction and moving towards the station, it has enough velocity here that we apply minus one, which means we are applying brake. So we apply brake now and it is going to slow down and gradually it will come to stop at this station. This is the end game of the train. If I find myself in this situation, this is the end game of the train. On the other hand, if I find myself here somewhere, here somewhere or here somewhere, that means here on this in this parabola, so if I find here with that speed, then I just apply plus one, which means I want the, the train to go in that direction, but it's very fast. So I'm gonna, it's, it, it's going fast, but it's going in this direction. Because Y is negative. So the train is here, it's going in that direction. So when I apply brake, brake is plus one because I'm, 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 I'm increasing the velocity in this direction. Decreasing the velocity in that direction is same as increasing the velocity in this direction. This is, this is something, in this picture you can, you can say that plus one now, in fact, is brake because the train is moving in opposite direction very fast. So in order for me, to bring the train here, I have to put the brake. And the brake has to slow the train down. Um, and oh, let me see what I'm doing here. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me. Let me. The train is here, going this direction. Uh, No, no, I'm sorry. 
Trend is moving in that direction because it's y is negative. I'm sorry. I, 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 I totally, totally. So the trend is moving in that direction. And I am now going to apply the break to slow it down. And the slowing it down, because it's moving in that direction, slowing down means u star is plus one. Because I'm decreasing the speed in the plus direction, uh, increasing the speed in, the, in this direction. Slowing in this direction means increasing the speed in that direction. And so apply the break. So apply the break and get it here. So the applying the break in, in this direction is, is called plus one, and applying the break here is called minus one. So the applying break is, is it depends on where you are, okay? You're slowing down the train in a certain direction, but the direction, acceleration has a direction, and the velocity has a direction. It's not speed. You're slowing down the speed. Speed has no direction, but velocity has a direction. So we are we need to do the plus and minus sign. Any anything anything confusing so far? Do you want me to continue? So what I'm trying to say is that if the train is along this parabola, this parabola or that parabola, which means a certain location and a certain speed, because that's what this parabola says. If I'm exactly at this point and that speed, that's a Goldilocks speed here for you. I can then apply the brake, bang bang control brake, because anything applying less than plus one, which is half, is only gonna, remember I want to minimize the time to get to the station. So this maximum principle says the only way I can do it is to use the, the maximum, maximum velocity, maximum acceleration or the, I mean, maximum plus acceleration or maximum deceleration, okay? That's what that means. This is the deceleration, this is the acceleration. So that's what I can do. So I, I, don't, I don't want to use half. Because if I use half, I'm not going to minimize time. That's, what, that, that's not optimal. Okay. So we solve the problem provided our initial condition is on this curve. So far, so good. Now. Yes, Professor. Yeah. Now what is going on is suppose I'm not on this curve. Suppose my train is here at this point. This point means I'm here with that velocity. That velocity does not allow me. So what I'm going to do is that is too slow moving in this direction. So if I do nothing, if I do nothing here, then the train will stop somewhere here. It's not going to go all the way to the station. So what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to accelerate it in that direction. So I'm going to increase the speed. Increase the speed in that direction. So my velocity, okay, well, speed and velocity. So, so basically what I'm doing, I'm putting plus one. No, I'm putting, no, I'm sorry. I'm putting minus one on this one. And that's going to, that's going to increase the, 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 the y part, which is the, the velocity in that direction, and it's going to increase up to this level. It will get to here, and I then know what to do. I switch, and I go here. So I solve the, the end part. The end part is here. So if I'm somewhere else, I have to come to this part first. That's what that means. So wherever you are, you're going to, if you're already on this, you don't need any switch. You're already at the, past the switching point, and so you can just go continuous and, and, and stop. If you're anywhere else, then you have to come to this part or this part before you get here. So these other parabola, it will tell you how you get to this switching point. Okay? So, 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 let's, let's, let's uh, derive these parabolas and then we'll come back to this picture again. So the first part is 
these parabolas, these parabolas are, so we can put this into a single switching curve, gamma, which is y equal to gamma of x, which is that and that. So that particular 3.92 is this whole gamma. This is a gamma. This is the gamma. Gamma minus is this part, gamma plus is this part. So if the initial state x0, y0 is not zero, but lies on gamma, then we have this, the problem is solved. All we need to find out is the time. All we need to find out is the time from here to here. That's very easy to do. So if you are not at zero, if you are zero, the problem is solved because zero is already on switching curve. There's nothing to do. If you are along this curve, wherever, then we already know what to do. The problem is solved and the solution is clear. And along the switching curve, we choose u star minus one and below it, we choose plus one. This is, this is simply true, okay? What if I'm not on this curve? This is the next part that we want to do. If I'm not on this curve, then if I look at initial point, let's put x0, y0 above the switching curve. So this is the point that we are now looking. We are now looking at this point. Similar analysis can be done on this point. That is probably left as an exercise. So we are beginning at this point. What do we now want to do at this point? First of all, we're going to have to end up either on this curve or this curve. Somehow. And that's the part. And we have to end up there with minus one and plus one. Those are the only choices we have. So let's do what happens. Let's look, let's see what we do. First, we solve the equation. Figure, fig, figure says that if you are here, then what is going on here? So what, look at the train now. The train is here and the velocity is quite high. So the train is going at a very high speed in that direction. There is no way I can use a brake to stop the train at the station. So the doors have to remain closed. Passengers cannot come out at the station on a moving train because there will be injuries. So the train overshoots the station because it's very high speed. So the train getting a break, which is U star minus one, speed is going down. As you can see, this parabola is slowing down. That parabola is, by the way, the, that parabola is the equation of this system. So let's look at the integrate these equations. When you put minus one, you integrate this equation. You get y equal to this, x equal to this. You eliminate t and you get this parabola. 3.93. 3.93 is this parabola. But we don't care about this part of the parabola. This parabola goes here and comes here. And then we know what to do. So what are we going to do here? We apply the brake. So the train is going in that direction, but its speed is slowing down in that direction because we put a brake. It's slowing down, slowing down, but it's still too fast. It doesn't stop. Still slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, overshoots the station and comes here and stops. Only instantly, its velocity is zero. But because this force is continues in that direction, that direction, what that direction means, if you're going this way, it's gonna slow you down. If you're going this way, it's gonna increase your speed. That's what U star minus one means, okay? So U star minus one, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, and slowing down, slowing down, but you continue with minus one, so it will start moving in this opposite direction. So the train goes like this, and it goes like this. So the train goes like this, high speed, low speed, low speed, and at this point, it starts moving this way. Moving this way means its, its coordinate is going along this curve. Yeah, 
This coordinate is going along this curve. And this curve is going to intersect at this point. We can easily find an intersection of this parabola and that parabola. That's easy to do. You solve two equations, you find x star, y star. And that is the point, is our Goldilocks point, right? That is the point where the train is here and the train is moving in that direction at that speed. But now we switch to plus one. So now we have to slow it down in that direction. So the train is moving in that direction and we are, it's a negative direction and we are slowing it down slowing it down, which means the train is here and slowly, slowly, slowly it comes here. So the optimal solution of a train moving very fast here is to decrease the speed all the way to zero, then come back up to this point, and then it's too slow to get here. So you, you put plus one and well, I mean, it, no, I'm sorry. It, 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 uh, so it's, it, it, it's zero. You increase the speed in this direction, but at this point it's too fast, so you put the brake and come in. Is that clear? That's what's going on. So, so these pictures are actually telling you what the train is doing along the track, because train is not jumping the track. It is staying on the track. But that only tells you what its velocity is, basically. So once we have this idea, all we have to do is, we already solved this, we already know this parabola, we already know this parabola, so we need to find x star, y star, and the next thing to do is to find out the t star, what time, okay? So those are the only two things we need to do. And once you know x star, y star, you can easily find the time, and we'll show you how to do that. So we got that parabola, now, we solve that parabola and the other parabola, and when you solve those two parabola, we get x star and y star, this, this lower star. The so lower star is this point right here. That's the point when we switch the control to plus one. The time t lower star is the time it takes to switch and curve called the switching time. Given that we start above it, you can see easily this is the solution. So if I can put y star here, I will get the, if I get lower y star, y low star, y sub star, not super star, y sub star here, then I'll get a minus t sub, I'll get t sub star. So if I put y, I get the t sub star as y zero minus y sub star, I already know why, why, why sub star is. So this is my t sub, t sub star. So the t, stubs, t sub star is the time that it took for me to go from y zero to y sub star, to go from x zero to x sub star. So that time is the time it took from here to here. And I'm now going to add that time to it to get the, cap, the, the full T star. So I'm going to add that time. That time is exactly coming from the table. In the table, you have this formula. You go back to the table. You already know T star. T star is the switching point. So you go to the table. And this is the switching point on gamma plus. So you go to the table to gamma plus. The table of gamma plus is this one. This is y t is t minus t star. And so we put the, the value of y, y this thing, and then you find the, this t star. So we go to that table and we find t star to be lower t star minus lower y star. We, we know both of these formulas. So we plug both of these formulas and we get our capital T star. Remember, in order to use, I already use, I already use the Hamiltonian condition in getting to this table. So all, that condition is already used. So we already have used every condition we, we have, and we got our T double star, T star. The problem is solved.
Now we give a numerical example. <clears throat> so numerical example is I begin with one one. So let's see where our picture is. I now begin here. One one. Instead of this parabola, I'm now on this parabola. So I begin at one one. I'm going to go like this, go like this and go like this. So I'm going to do all those calculations. We have all the calculations. We just have to plug in the values. So x0, y0, then the 3.93, which is the equation of parabola, becomes 2x minus 3y squared. We substitute the value of y0 and all of that in this. So we get t star is this minutes and substitute again and find the minimum t star. So we have all the formulas. And we can tell you that the minimum time is one plus square root of six. So go from here, there, and there. So the train, the train is not on this direction. The train is already already in the plus side, but it is still moving in that direction because this is plus y. So it's still moving in that direction. Just like that guy was still moving in that direction until here. So we are now here, it's still moving in that direction. And at this point it comes to stop and it starts moving in that direction. But in that direction, it starts moving, but it's too slow because if it's zero, it'll just stay there. So it's not moving in that direction up to here, up to this point. That point has a velocity which is too high in that direction for it to stop. So you break again and you go here. So this is an acceleration and breaking point, okay? So here I'm, for example, here, if I'm here, I'm accelerating. I'm increasing the speed in positive direction. I'm accelerating to get here. Then I'm decelerating in that direction, positive direction. So I'm applying minus one and come to here. So it's not um, if you if you go to the the space program, there will be many different switching points because you have three dimensional movements. So it's not going to be one place you switch because we have we have several controls and each of them would have to be switched, and it may not be just one switch. It may be more than one because problem may not be so simple. And then you have to worry about the gravity. <clears throat> oh. You have to worry about the Earth and the Moon's gravity. And at some point, the two gravities are kind of equal and, 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 and it's, it's somewhere there, there where the Moon gravity and Earth gravity cancel each other. Um, and so there's no pull or push at that particular point. But eventually then you have to go to the moon's orbit. So there, there are a lot of other things going on, <clears throat> but but you can sort of see that is a, it's gonna be a control problem in the same spirit as this problem. <clears throat> Any question here? You have some exercises to, 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 start from different points. We now go to infinite horizon problem. So far, we have studied the problem where T was finite or T was a decision variable. Now we discuss the case where T actually is infinity. We had formulated such problem in chapter one. The advertising problem, which was example two, was an example in which T was infinity. One thing I like to tell you <clears throat> is when T equal to infinity, when T equal to infinity, we need to have a discount rate. Because if we don't have a discount rate, then the objective function 
can be infinity for many different trajectories. And if the objective force is infinity for many different trajectories, which one do I choose? <clears throat> well, everything is optimal. Well, optimal, you cannot do better than infinity. But infinity is such a big, big thing, you know. You could be infinity and you could be infinity in many different ways. And so many, I mean, for example, if I take the integral from zero to infinity of one dt, it's going to give you infinity. If I take the integral from zero to infinity of two times dt, it's also going to be infinity. That means the control of one all the way and the control of two all the way both give you infinity. But if I discount the one all the way to infinity, the integral of one dt, if you eat integral of e to the minus rho t dt is one divided by rho. And integral of two times e to the minus rho t is two divided by rho. So you can see now I can distinguish between different values of integral and I can select the one that gives me the maximum. So I need rho bigger than zero to begin with. <clears throat> Which is true because in most of our problems, the objective function is expressed in dollars or utilities and most of them get discounted and the discount rate is then rho. And so we are not, we are not too worried about that. So the function f x comma u comma t, I have to put e to the minus rho t times f. But if I put e to the minus rho t times f, and I don't remove this t, let's go all the way to the beginning. If I put e to the minus rho t here, because I'm allowed, it's a function of t. So I could put e to the minus rho t times f. So it is a function of t, but if I also leave this t here, then it is not only a discounted function of t, it also another function of t coming in. For example, uh, this t could be winter and summer, okay, seasonal kind of t. We don't want that right now, okay. So what we want is we, the dependence on t here, we only want the dependence in, in the row time. If I also have this t, and I have e to the minus rho t, and I have this t, then this, and, and this t is infinity, then this infinitizing problem is called non-stationary, and non-stationary problems are very difficult to solve. And also not very interesting to solve because non-stationary problem means that I have to know everything about this function all the way to infinity. Notice all of these functions and these things depends on some kind of forecast in our field, because they, if there's a demand that has to be satisfied, then there's a demand forecast. It's not easy to forecast the demand all the way to infinity. So we sort of saying, okay, demand is constant, but it's a random variable, whatever, whatever. But we, we remove this t, we remove this t, we remove this t, but we put this t, e to the minus rho t. So the problem has time dependence, but it is stationary. F and small f do not depend on time. And we're only looking now at a stationary problem. We will not look at the non-stationary inferiorizing problems. There's a literature on that. It's not, it's not a problem that hasn't been studied, but it's something that is not so interesting for us. So this is the second bullet, <clears throat> third bullet. Not, no one can see non -stationary, third, so stationary, okay. And it's also in most cases. And I will at some point, sometime in chapter five, I will give you some things about what I mean by most cases. For all practical purposes, we will not have the salvage value because at infinity, what value do you want to put at infinity? If you have an inventory at infinity, who's going to use it? It's infinity, it's finished. So 
the psi x, which is the Selvas value, is in most cases going to be zero. If it's not zero, it is because of some quickiness of the problem, which we will talk a little bit about later, but is, most of it is not going to be our concern. Uh, but it's good to know, you know, what, what, what are the issues uh, relating to the Selvas value at infinity. And then the remark, we are not talking about stationarity, but both capital F and small f are independent of time. But we also had um, a s autonomous system in exercise 2.9. The system is not autonomous because we still have a time dependence. The autonomous system is no time dependence. But, but now we have a system that's not autonomous, but it's stationary because the time dependence is only coming through discovery. So that's a little distinction in technical terminology. So this is our problem. Our problem now is to minimize, maximize an integral, no salvage value, discount rate, no t in there, subject to x dot equal to fxu, no t there, x0 equal to x0, subject to gxu, no t there, <coughs> some constraint. No T there. So this is coming straight from current value formulation of chapter three. And that's our problem. <clears throat> SX zero, uh, we go all the way to chapter two. And if you look at the formulas there, uh, and so that's again important for you to read this before you come here, because we can't always keep going back, especially now to to various formulas that are available uh, in the book. So that's the present value. Present value formulation. That was a formula that was given to us, but we know what lambda p v present value t in terms of current value. We know that lambda p v t is nothing but e to the minus rho t lambda t v. We did that in chapter three. Uh, last week we did that, and so that condition boils down to this condition. And if if there is no, if it's a free endpoint problem, then that condition go boils down to this condition. So instead of lambda t equal to zero in a free endpoint problem, we have a asymptotic value of lambda t as zero. Okay, because this this is what that this is what the immediate extension of the condition s t goes to infinity means. We're not proving anything anymore. We're just going heuristics and using whatever we can to get. What if sometimes it is also important that even though I don't care about infinity, what its value is. But I do care about the fact that I don't go broke. So if, if, we, if it's an issue of wealth, I don't want to go broke at any point in time. So I want at least terminal value to be bigger than or equal to zero. So this is, in some cases, maybe you want that. And, 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 and so if you put that condition, then we again have the transversality condition goes to this value, because now we have a complementary slackness condition. We're basically going back here, but we are breaking it down to two. Two. One is a complementary slackness condition, and one is this positivity condition. This condition imply 3.98, which is right here. Okay. So now let's solve our familiar problem where we had wt bigger than or equal to zero, but now I want to say that, that I'm an immortal guy and this immortal guy doesn't want to go broke ever. But 
by the way, in China, they have six immortals, so it's not completely unthinkable um, that people can live all the way to infinity because there are mythologies about it. So this is a mythological problem in some way. But we're going to we know much of the finance and economics has infinity as a, as a terminal time because without infinity, um, there are problems. So one problem is, what do you do? If it's not infinity, what do you do at T? Nobody knows, generally speaking. And the second one is, if it is T, then problem is more difficult sometimes because the control depends on time remaining. But if the problem is infinite horizon, then time remaining is always infinity. So the control doesn't depend on small t. The control is independent of small t. Because, because small t is basically time remaining. And the time remaining is the same no matter where you are. And so control cannot depend on small t. But in a finite way, it depends on small t. And because it depends on small t, it's more complicated. So sometimes inferiorizing problems are easier to solve. And so there are at least two reasons why, why we solve inferiorizing problems. Even in in the world where no one, no one, no one is guaranteed to live all the way to infinity, not even our solar system, not, not even our solar system is going to live all the way to infinity. Even, even we don't know if the universe is going to stay all the way to infinity, but, but we don't know that. <clears throat> okay, but the solar system is going to die in 4 billion years. So now we have W dot and we have initial value W zero. So we solve this problem. Well, we apply the limiting version of the maximum principle 3.42. We already have solved this problem. So we can include our, our solution. We, we can take the limit in our solution and we take the limit, we get this W star T, we get this C star T, we get this lambda T. This is coming all the way by taking the limit on those problems. So here's why I want to say. <clears throat> when I say most cases, these are also the cases in which a limit of the finite horizon problem gives you an infinite horizon solution. The cases where this becomes important, even in the infinite horizon, are the cases in which the limit of the finite horizon problem do not give you the solution of the infinite horizon problem. You don't know why at this point right now, but you will see later in chapter five that we'll take a limit of a finite horizon problem and not only not that we don't get the optimal solution, we in fact get the worst possible solution ever. That means we take the limit of the optimal solution as t goes to infinity, and what we end up is a solution which is the worst possible solution, not, not optimal, it is pessimal solution, uh, which means that what you optimize actually is, instead of, you have optimization problem, but you get a solution that actually give you a minimal solution. So here, everything is hunky-dory, um, problems are good, and we, we can take the limit, we solve the problem, we can find the J star, so the problem is solved. So this is one part that we do. The other part we do is a concept called optimal long run stationary equilibrium. That means in the inferiorizing problem, either you are already in equilibrium or you are a transitional phase, which eventually will go to equilibrium. When I say eventually go to equilibrium, the eventually can be either finite, that means at a finite time you will attain equilibrium and then you will stay there all the way to infinity, remainder time. Or you will never achieve the equilibrium. You will achieve the equilibrium, so to speak, at infinity which means that you will always remain transient, 
but asymptotically you will get to equilibrium. That means you approach the equilibrium, but you never get there. Okay, so those problems will come to us as well later. Chapter seven, we will look into some of those. So, <clears throat> what is the equilibrium? First of all, so if you have infinite horizon problem and you're looking for equilibrium, which is either asymptotic or finitely uh, obtain, attainable, then that part of the problem is easy to solve, easier than solving the transient problems. And believe me, a lot of papers have been written on control priority economic problems, where all you do is to solve for infinite horizon problem. So here is the solution. You set x star equal to zero and lambda r equal to zero. That's what we mean by equilibrium. We, by equilibrium, we mean all motion ceases. There's no more motion. X dot is zero means there's no velocity in our other problem, or the wealth has become, it's not growing anymore. So that's lambda dot zero, it means there's no shadow prices that remain the same. So if you do that, then let's call that equilibrium to be X bar, U bar. And of course, lambda bar. And if you have this condition here, then there's a, there's a mu, we form a Lagrangian, so there's a mu bar. So X bar, U bar, lambda bar, mu bar is an equilibrium. It satisfies basically these conditions. First, you set X bar dot equal to, X dot dot equal to zero. That gives you one equation. You get lambda dot equal to zero, which, which is the lambda dot equation, which is rho lambda equal to derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to X. Hmm? Did I make a mistake here? Oh, no, I didn't make a mistake. Uh, lambda dot is zero, so rho lambda becomes equal to this. <clears throat> so that's, the, when you set x dot equal to zero, you get f x bar equal to zero, and lambda dot equal to zero, you get this equation. <clears throat> so this is fine. <clears throat> I, was I, I was worried about the minus sign. So, and then the complementary slackness condition is mu bar becomes zero this And then Hamiltonian must be satisfied. So there's a u bar that satisfies this. So if you have x bar, u bar, lambda, you are satisfied this, you, you have an equilibrium. <clears throat> In all economics books, you will never find this part. So they define, is there a u bar here? How come there's no U bar here? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. It should not be U bar. <clears throat> it says for all U that satisfy this equation, that Hamiltonian, must be maximized. So this should not be U bar. It's 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 good. <clears throat> this is U bar, but this is saying you take the maximum over this U, not over U bar, because U bar is a maximum. So that's what U bar on this side, U on this side. If you don't have this constraint, which is in most economics books, you find the definition of this <clears throat> as a triple, <clears throat> not a quadruple, but a triple, which is this. <clears throat> this is zero, this is this, is this, this. It's, and they also actually, <clears throat> because, because there is no constraint, you can maximize this by using a first order condition. So this whole thing, this whole thing here could be written this way. So we have three equations no differential equation anymore. And we have three equations and three variables, x bar, u bar, and lambda bar. I mean, in a, in a, in a scalar case, if, 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 if x has got vector, is a vector, then, you know, of course, there might be more equations. Uh, but just take a scalar case, 
We have three equations, three variables, and we solve these three equations. And in this case, an exercise 3.40, you show that J star is exactly this. You take the integral and you get this. And in 3.7, if you let T go to infinity uh, in 3.105, which is right here, because this one, uh, if you take let T go to infinity, then you are approaching. See here, for example, you are you are only approaching the equilibrium because the equilibrium is when everything becomes static, no motion. So you can see that this this problem, the the wealth <coughs> wealth is declining, but it never actually goes to um, um, uh, its equilibrium value. So you can sort of see the wealth is zero, zero, infinity, rho bigger than r. If rho is bigger than r, that's because the, the, the discount rate is bigger than the earning rate. If they are equal, you get this. And if they are, if rho is less than discount rate, earning is very high, then you will end up at infinite amount of wealth at infinity. That's your equilibrium. So the only equilibrium that is sensible in this setting is this one. Because I mean, the, the, this is correct, but it is useless because it's not <clears throat> interesting to have this. And generally speaking, we do not assume the discount rate to be bigger than R. And so we, we don't get this as well. But look at this. <clears throat> it's an interesting problem. Can you, can you tell me what is going on here? <clears throat> Notice. <clears throat> When there was no salvage value in this problem, <clears throat> we solved the problem here. <clears throat> Where is the 105? <clears throat> yeah. When we solved the problem with no salvage value, that was the problem when we have a B0, we ended up with zero. We also had a problem where this was bigger than or equal to zero, but for sufficiently large, a sufficiently small B, which is a, not enough, not enough value given to the, the charity or the children, then you end up with W2 equal to zero. <clears throat> because if the B was too small or zero, right now B is zero. There's no B here. There's no salvage value. And I don't want to go bankrupt. You would think that for every capital T, which is finite, this problem will have a zero. You will consume everything. And you will consume and leave, a, end up at a zero wealth at capital T. What's happening here? What is happening when you go to infinity? <clears throat> In infinity, you're consuming in equilibrium at a constant rate of rho w0. So if you begin at w0, then you're always in equilibrium. There's no transient. If you, if you don't go there, then this is your asymptotic value. But let's assume that you begin at W0. If you begin at W0, you, you are already in equilibrium. You will consume a constant amount, and you will, you will have lambda bar equal to this. But if you assume a constant amount, the constant amount is exactly equal to the earnings. So basically, you are assuming you are earning, earning you're consuming interest. But you're not consuming the principle. The principle stays all the way to infinity the same. Now, if there was a finite time t, then I will consume all the interest <clears throat> and I will consume a little bit of interest, little bit of W0. And I will consume W0 in such a way 
then the principal also goes to zero. So what I'm going to do is, it's like a sinking fund. You have money in your retirement fund, and you take certain amount of money every, in, including the interest. You take certain amount of money, and which is more than the interest, and then you end up with a zero wealth at the end. But here, you are never able to consume your principal. Why? Can anybody tell me why? What's going on here? This is our equilibrium. This man will never consume anything of the principal all the way. This is, this is saying that if you're infinitely, if you are infinitely lived individual, there is no way for you to consume your principal in an optimal way. Because if you consume the principal <clears throat> in some way, then that principal will decline. And if that principal decline, your consumption will decline. Which is okay in a finite horizon case because you're consuming a little bit more than the interest rate. Even though your wealth is declining, you're consuming less and less. But in the end, you end up with zero. But because you're consuming more, but eventually you're consuming less, overall, you're still better off. <clears throat> Here what happens is, if you consume a little bit more than your interest, then the amount that you're consuming, which is less all the way to infinity, will not, will not compensate you for that, that extra consumption. Because, because you're earning interest rate all the way to infinity. And, 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 and so the, the loss of the interest over the infinity is too large to allow you to spend anything from the principal. Okay, so with that, we, we close this part. And I think we have basically one more thing to do before we finish. So let me spend one more minute. There's something called golden path. Economics is famous for that. The golden path is not same as long run stationary equilibrium. Golden path is a different concept. It says, suppose I am given an initial value X. And I am going to keep that initial value <clears throat> all the way which means that I am going to set my control in such a way so that I, no, I, I don't keep the initial value all the way. I'm going to keep the x dot zero all the way. Yeah, so that means the x will also be stayed all the way. So I will keep the initial value. <clears throat> and then if you solve this, you will find u sub x. That's the amount in the consumption case you'll consume depending on your wealth. And then put that U sub X in your objective function. Since objective function integrates this, but the integrand is constant because X is constant. So you don't have to integrate it. You have to maximize the integrand because integrand is the same everywhere, so maximizing the integral is same as maximizing integrand. And if you maximize this over x, then the value of the initial condition that you get and the control that you get for that initial condition is called the golden path. So the golden path is the best initial condition among all in the initial conditions. It's the best initial condition among all initial condition if you want to keep that initial condition forever. So what is the best initial condition for which you want to maintain the best initial condition? 
Best initial condition doesn't mean it is the best initial condition for long run stretched equilibrium. It is the best initial condition in terms of golden path. OK, and later on we will an example where you will see that even though. I don't have an initial condition, which is the best initial condition. I can do better than golden path. Because golden path constrain me. To pick an initial condition. Which is best under certain certain regime, OK? And then this is this is this is just a summary of. If you have objective function like this and state equation like this, then you have bang bang solution. If you have this thing like this, you have a linear decision rule. So this is basically a summary. We almost tried to drop this in the book, but since we had in the first edition, I decided to keep it. Uh, it, it gives you a different model types. It would be more interesting if you use the model type all the time. Um, <clears throat> Let me let me. Are you OK if I take another two, three minutes to finish this so we can do chapter four next time? Sure, Professor. OK, no okay. so let's just do that. Uh, uh, the, the only two cases that are important here. Th these are these are these are nothing. It basically has an objective function state equation and gives you air joint equation and given the air joint equation, you maximize the Hamiltonian, you get a policy and that policy has. Basically, you know, it, it has some. You can characterize it in some way, but it's not not all that. Uh, it's all you already know all of that. So what I'm interested in this. <clears throat> Sometimes. I get absolute value. Which is not differentiable. At zero. This could be uh, ar arising when you are, let's say, trading in a stock market. You buy, U is plus, you sell, U is minus. But the broker commission is positive, whether you buy or sell. So the broker commission is based on absolute value. So if you buy five stock, five shares, let's say they charge you $1. If you sell five shares, they also charge you $1. So broker commission is the absolute value of you. So how do we solve that problem? Well, what you do is you break the U into U and minus U2. One is buying, one is selling, and you assume both to be bigger than or equal to zero. And in order for you to make sure that that one of both one of them is always zero, because otherwise it is not true. To break this into this condition, you must have this condition. And that condition is nonlinear. Regardless. You now have a problem where everything is differential. So we can still apply the theorem that we learned in chapter two and three. But in the example that I gave you, you don't need to impose this condition because why would you want to buy and sell at the same time? If you buy 10 stock and sell five, you might as well buy five because you buy 10 and sell five, you're paying you're paying commission on 15 shares. So you might as well just buy five, which means that one of them will always be zero. If you want to buy net, then sell will be zero. If you if you sell net, then buy will be zero. And so all of these cases, that will become U1 plus U2. So that and that, this will become U1 plus U2. So that's one way to, so, and we'll see this in, in chapter five. The other thing I want to show you is that bang bang has a generalization. So if this is a vector, then Hamiltonian in a linear linear case would be GT times U, where U is a vector, G is a vector, and this is a linear programming problem. The linear programming problem is, so the equation is given by this. We have a, we have a initial condition is this, and so, the, so this is the objective function, which is linear, and this is the state equation, which is linear. So if the objective function is linear, we will have a bang bang solution. But the bang bang solution is not like switching from one point to the next, like switching from minus one to plus one kind of thing. It is maximize the Hamiltonian times U 
the, the Hamiltonian, which is the U part of the Hamiltonian, subject to this condition. So this is a linear programming problem. This could be C1, U1 plus C2, U2 plus C3, U3. And this could be A1, U1 plus A2, U2 plus A3, U3 bigger than or equal to zero. So that's your linear programming problem. And so the bang bang mean linear programming is always have a simplex, which looks like this, like this, like this. And it simplex method says you go from one point to the next point. So you move along the simplex. So as 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 your lambda changes, you move from this point to this point, then to this point, then to this point. That so the bang bang becomes a linear programming problem. And the last remark is that if I have a fixed endpoint problem, then this is not a function unless t is a variable. So if I have a fixed endpoint problem and t is fixed, then that function can be removed. But I have it for the uniformity of the presentation. So this function only makes sense in two cases. One is that xt is, one is that xt is free and t is fixed. The other one is xt is fixed and t is free. And the third one is xt is free and t is free. So those two are extreme cases, but in between cases also possible. Okay. So that's uh, the remark. And then there's an impulse control that we don't want to worry about right now. We will, we will have some example of that in chapter seven. Okay, I'm done. If there are questions, I can uh, answer right now. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Okay, thank you then.